Okay, I hope you have all your questions that have been being collected. Jack Krauskopf will moderate a session now uh, with your questions. So, I think all these questions are inevitably going to take off from the whole conference as well as from what Absolutely. you said, and you've been clearly well briefed. So, mm -hmm. you're right. How do large entrenched nonprofits remain flexible and adaptable to meet unexpected challenges? Well, um, I think. I think there are a couple of things. One, you have to create a culture of flexibility. So you really institutionally and organizationally have to break down the barriers, the silos. It's very, very hard and difficult work. You have to put structures in place that promote innovation, questioning the status quo, and it starts with the leadership of the organization. So not just the CEO, but all of the leaders in the organization of all of the business units have to embrace uh, innovation and really be very deliberate about it. So some of the things that certainly we've done uh, is really developing a strategy for inquiry and really reflection as we're looking at our programs, as we're looking at the marketplace, and embedding that in the culture and the systems of the organization. So here's one about Sandy. Uh, how do you define the hardest hit area of Superstorm Sandy? And I'm going to add a little suffix to that. Uh, what role do you see the United Way playing in preparation of the nonprofit sector for future storms and unexpected disasters in the city? So we used a very, very rigorous process where we looked at the FEMA claims for individual assistance. We also looked at and triangulated the community's opportunity or ability to respond, looking at the median income levels of communities that were impacted. Um, we looked at a, a whole lot of algorithms and developed this very, very complicated formula to determine where we would focus our efforts. So it really was on, on, on areas that objectively certainly were identified by the government agencies as having significant you know, physical infrastructure damage and that individuals were really hurting, but there were also neighborhoods and communities that did not have the resources or the savings to weather the storm. And so that's what we define as hardest hit and those are where we directed our resources. And then the second part? What role do you see the United Way playing in helping the nonprofit sector to be ready for future unexpected events, disaster events? So uh, uh, several things you know, came out of certainly our experience and the role that we played in Sandy. Uh, one was about infrastructure and you know, making sure that there are resources available for, I mean, physical infrastructure needs of nonprofits in the event of disaster. And, and much, uh, many of our resources went out the door to support those organizations. Um, and also helping with disaster preparedness and contingency planning going forward. It's something every, no one ever has time to do, and who knows when anything is going to happen, but really facilitating technical assistance and resources around that is something that we'll certainly do uh, going forward with our work in strengthening nonprofits and really being responsive to the field. What do you think you need? What would you like to do? And thirdly, or, or fourthly, um, really, really, really working hard uh, in bringing people together to collaborate, to share resources, best practices, to leverage assets, and to start doing that now so that when that next disaster hits, you have, you know, buddy systems or, you know, ways where we can really work better together and more efficiently and effectively to meet the needs of the challenges. So the first question I asked you was about the large nonprofits. This one is how can the United Way help small, effective nonprofits to do their significant work? Well, in the ways that we have been doing and we will continue to do, uh, we support uh, you know over 500 nonprofits here in the city and in all the areas in which we work, education, income, and health, with resources, with technical assistance. Um, you know, and, and, and so we will certainly continue to do that. 
as I said, we're going to be much more deliberate in our work going forward and identify those small, effective nonprofits as we invest in them, as we work together to develop effective programs and, and strategies, as we work with them around policy changes for the system as well. So we're going to continue to build on the work that we've done in the past, and most of the work that we've done have, have been with small, effective nonprofits. Here, here's one that I think is seeking some general advice. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you're working for an organization whose focus seems to be survival? How do you respond when you're not working with quote unquote stars? Hmm. Well, you know, one of the things, uh, if you don't feel empowered, that you can really influence the direction and make the change, but that's the first thing that I would say. You know, so many people have a wait and see approach or I'll give a critique, but not a recommendation. Um, you have to take it upon yourself to speak up and say, these are some of the things that I think are missing that need to be fixed, that how we need to adjust and adapt. You have to take some ownership and leadership over what you bring to the table because it's important and valuable. And you need to do that. And you'll, you might be surprised. People might actually listen and say, wow, that's important. Maybe we should do that. Maybe we should think about that. But if you don't get that response, but you need to do that first, then you have to think about how do you want to t spend your time and, and your treasure and your talent. And you always have to make sure that you're aligned in your work, your vocation, with or an organization that you believe in and people that you believe in. So you got to make those decisions. In your speech, you referenced some lessons learned from Japan in yes. that way. Can you say what some of the concrete recommendations were? And then this questioner is also seeking information about uh, what you, your thoughts are about climate change. Oh, what are my thoughts about climate change? It's happening. <laughs> I'm hot right now. Um, you can take the first question. <laughs> Japan, they had a plethora of really amazing insights. And one, again, how nonprofits on the ground who are direct service providers, how they all have these plans that are connected to one another. And all of these, well, if this happens, then this is what we'll do. And everybody knows what everybody else is going to be doing. But I mean, this is something that obviously they've been experiencing for decades and decades and decades. So it's, it's a, a part of their system. How the government is organized around the response is also, I mean, very well organized. Very well organized. So they had, uh, you know, pages and pages of, of detailed recommendations that we were able to take back to the government. But, but it all really hinges on a level of uh, expectation. Count on it happening. We know it's going to happen. And then how do we knit together the social infrastructure that is in existence to meet the demands of what we know is going to happen? So a lot of certainly working with the Governor's Commission and the other groups that have formed to be very clear about what we know can happen, what are all the possibilities, identifying very clearly where our strengths are, what our assets are, where our gaps are, and then we've got a lot of work to do to build the capacity to really confront the next storm. But it has to be done in collaboration and in conversation with all the stakeholders at the table. But they had a lot of uh, very sophisticated approaches to the work. A couple of related questions about being realistic about what organizations can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. when, when unexpected events require you to stretch beyond normal boundaries, how far do you stretch? When do you stop stretching? What gets folded into normal organ operations? And what have you learned in your 100 days that you'll stop doing? Um, it, it, it's almost intuitive, right? If you keep stretching to where it really hurts and you feel like you're going to break the organization, stop. Try to stop before that. But you, you know, I mean, it's again, it's about being really honest, right? And, and it's, it's not new to the nonprofit community. Somebody walks in your door, they have a crisis, an issue, that it's on fire. It's not part of your plan. It was not what you had planned to do. But your inclination is, we got to meet this need. We got to do this thing. 
And it's very, very difficult to say, no, I can't. I don't have the resources and to, t to pause. But so many organizations, as we know, have gone to try and solve all the problems only to be a casualty and to no longer be in existence. So being very clear again, what are your strengths? What are your gaps? What are other things that other people are doing that you can you know, lean on or refer to? But if you, if you are not clear about who you are and who you're not, you know, you'll, you'll take on, try to take on everything and anything. So I think it starts there. Here's an inevitable question that goes beyond Sandy. What role should United Way play in advocacy regarding city, state, and federal budget underlined three times and program policies? That has uh, not been seen as an important role in the past, according to this question. It's a very important role, and I fundamentally absolutely believe that the United Way should play a significant role in policy and advocacy around resources, around a lot of things. Um, the organization has been evolving. It, it really was for many, many, many years. We're 75 years this year. It was a community chest, and people would put resources into it, and it would distribute those funds to a wide variety of organizations. About 10 years ago, the United Way entire system started to really evolve from that model, which was not about policy, was not about advocacy, and was really about you know, making sure that small nonprofits could get resources that they desperately needed that they would not have normally received from individuals in the corporate sector, which was the main uh, supporters of the workplace campaigns of the United Way. So 10 years ago, really made a strategic decision that we're going to have real impact in these three programmatic areas, education, income, and health. And we have to move from being a community chess to a community impact player. And we all know you can't have true impact and change without policy. We can all do exceedingly wonderful, important programs on the ground that benefit the 100, 200, 3,000, however many people we serve, and that's fantastic. But at the end of the day, we really do need to be changing systems. And so the United Way of New York City has adopted, before I even got here, a program to policy approach, where we're getting the lessons from the ground, and then we're turning to government uh, at every level and saying, these are the policy changes that we need to make, whether it's about where we allocate our resources, or, or in any ways that we think that there are going to be some significant opportunity to move the needle on these issues where policy is concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Thank you, Sheena Wright. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Kraska. Um, okay, now, before you go, I really, really, really want to hear what each of you think on those evaluation forms because the whole topic of being resilient came from you last year from those evaluations. So please fill them out. The second thing is, some of you may think that this program ends today. It doesn't. This is a series. Thanks to our wonderful, generous sponsors. There's another program on March 28th. It's Venable LLP presenting raising funds for nonprofits and about legal issues and pitfalls affecting fundraising. So I want to hear from you. Please fill out those evaluations. I want to thank our sponsors, American Express, Emblem Health, the New York Community Trust, and United Way of New York City, our program committee, and all of those 17 organizations, and most of all, you, for being here today. Thank you very much, and we'll be seeing you soon. Thank you.